Kylo Limit Loren here, talking to you about evaluating limits analytically. What's a Jedi's favorite car? A toy Yoda! So the first vocabulary term is indeterminate form. That's any of the seven undefined expressions, zero over zero, infinity over infinity, zero times infinity, infinity minus infinity, infinity to the zero power, zero to the zero power, and one to infinity, that a mathematical function may assume by formal substitution. So what this means is that if you were given a limit and you are substituting the, let's say in this particular limit, you're substituting the three in for X, right? To figure out what your limit is. And you get zero over zero. This would be called an indeterminate form. Now, because this is an indeterminate form, you must simplify the expression to determine your limit. We'll get into that more later. There are three basic limits in theorem 1.1. It says let b and c be real numbers, let n be a positive integer. So the limit as x approaches c of b, where b is just a constant, is equal to the constant, right? Because there's nothing to plug your c in for. It's just a number, so your limit of a number is equal to that same number. The second limit, the limit as x approaches c of x, is equal to c. What this means is that when you're taking the limit as x approaches c of x, all you have to do is take that c, plug it in to the function right here for x, and you get your limit. Straight up substitution. Same thing here. If you have x to some power and you're taking the limit as x approaches c of x to some power, you just take that c, plug it in for x, and you get your limit. Let's try to do this in under 12 parsecs. It's example time. Example one says find the following limits. We have the limit as x approaches two of three. Since three is a constant, the limit as x approaches anything of a constant is just equal to the constant. Part B says limit as x approaches negative four of x. Again, since we have x here, we take negative four, plug it in for x, and we get our limit, which is negative four. Part C, we have the limit as x approaches three of x squared. Again, since there's an x here, you just take that three, plug it in for x, and simplify to get your limit. That would be nine. So the limit as x approaches three of x squared equals nine. I'm sick of trying. You try. I'm choking you. Do you feel it? First one, the limit as x approaches 2 of 3x squared. We have an x here, so we just take that 2, plug it in for x here, and then simplify. 2 squared gives you 4, and then 4 times 3 gives you 12. That is the limit. The limit as x approaches 100 of x. Take that 100, plug it in for x, and you get your limit, which is 100. The limit as x approaches negative 5 of 4, 4 is just a constant. So the limit of a constant is equal to the constant. The limit as x approaches 3 of 2x to the 4th, take that 3, plug it in for x, and then simplify 3 to the 4th is going to give you 81 times 2 gives you 162. Now let's talk about theorem 1.2, properties of limits, that says let b and c be real numbers, let n be a positive integer, and let f and g be functions with the limit as x approaches c of f of x equals l, and the limit as x approaches c of g of x equals k. So the first property, the scalar multiple property, says if you're taking the limit as x approaches c of f of x, and you multiply f of x by some constant b, then your limit is going to equal whatever the limit was of f of x times that same constant. The second property, the sum or difference property, says the limit as x approaches c of f of x plus or minus g of x is equal to the sum or difference of their two limits, which makes sense. Same thing with the product property. The limit as x approaches c of f of x times g of x is equal to the product of their two limits. The quotient property says the limit as x approaches c of f of x divided by g of x is equal to the quotient of their two limits. And then lastly, the power property says the limit as x approaches c of f of x to some power equals the limit of f of x to that same power. That works the same way for radicals, right? Because this could be a rational exponent, could be a fraction. And if you had the limit as x approach c of the nth root of f of x, that's equal to the nth root of that limit. So example two says use the information to evaluate the limits. We have the limit as x approaches c of four times f of x. What is the limit as x approaches c of f of x? The limit as x approaches c of f of x equals two. Now, by the scalar multiple property, our limit as x approaches c of 4 times f of x is just 4 times 2, which is going to be 8. Now, we have the limit as x approaches c of f of x plus g of x. Now, we know the limit as x approaches c of f of x. We also know the limit as x approaches c of g of x. We have 2 and 3 fourths. So all we have to do is add together those two limits, and we get our limit as x approaches c of the sum of those two functions. Part C says the limit as x approaches c of f of x times g of x. All we have to do is just multiply the two limits together because we know the limit as x approaches c of each of these separately. So if we multiply the two limits together, we get our limit as x approaches c of those two functions multiplied together. 
the limit as x approaches c of f of x to the three halves power. If we know the limit as x approaches c of f of x, which is two, then we just take two and raise it to the three halves power, which is the same thing as the square root of two cubed, which is then going to be rad eight, which is two rad two. Part E, a little different, says given the limit as x approaches c of h of x equals 64, find the limit as x approaches c of the cube root of h of x. So if we know that the limit as x approaches c of h of x equals 64, then if the limit as x approaches c of the cube root of h of x is just the cube root of 64, which is 4. That's how that works. Yoda's a little green idiot. You try it. So again, scalar multiple rule says the limit as x approaches c of 6 times f of x is equal to 6 times 7, right? Because the limit as x approaches c of f of x is 7. So if you multiply 6 times the limit as x approaches c of f of x, you multiply the 6 times the 7 to get you a limit of 42. The limit as x approaches c of f of x plus g of x, you again just add the two limits together and you end up getting 7.5. 15 over 2. The limit as x approaches c of f of x times g of x, you multiply the two limits together, and you get 3 halves or 7 over 2. The limit as x approaches c of f of x divided by g of x, you divide the two limits and then get your new limit, which is 7 times 2 or 14. Lastly, over here, we have given the limit as x approaches c of g of x is 49, find the limit as x approaches c of the square root of g of x. If we know the limit as x approaches c of g of x is 49, then the limit as x approaches c of the square root of g of x is equal to the square root of 49, which is 7. Theorem 1.3, the limits of polynomial and rational functions, says if p is a polynomial function and c is a real number, then the limit as x approaches c of p of x is equal to p of c. Similarly, it says if r is a rational function given by r of x is equal to p of x over q of x and c is a real number such that q of c is not equal to zero, then the limit as x approaches c of r of x is equal to r of c, which is equal to p of c over q of c. This looks super confusing, but all it's saying is that if you have a polynomial or a rational function, which is just a polynomial over a polynomial, and you take the limit as x approaches c of that polynomial, just plug in c for x or your variable and you get your limit. That's it. So again, the limit as x approaches some number of a polynomial, just plug in that number for your variable in the polynomial and you get your limit. Same thing down here. We have a rational function. Take that c, plug it in for x in the numerator and denominator and you get your limit. Okay, you're just plugging in. So example three says find the following limit. So the limit as x approaches two of four x squared plus three. Again, this is a polynomial. So all you have to do, take that two, plug it in to find the limit. So we plug it in for x, two squared gives you four, four times four gives you 16, and then 16 plus three gives you 19. Here, the limit as x approaches negative three of x cubed minus two x plus five. This is a polynomial. So all you have to do, take that negative three, plug it in for your variable and then find your limit. So if we plug in negative three for x, we cube it and get negative 27. Over here, negative two times negative three gives you positive six. And then we add all these together, we get negative 16. For part C, we have the limit as x approaches one of this rational function. Again, since it's a polynomial over polynomial, you just plug in the one for each of the x's, right? Because it's the limit as x approaches one. So you plug in one for each of the x's and then simplify it up getting two. Lastly, we have the limit as x approaches negative eight of the absolute value of x over x. Now, what you're gonna do here is just plug it in, just like you see it. It's the limit as x approaches negative eight. So we take negative eight, plug it in for each of the x's. And to simplify, we end up getting eight over negative eight, which is negative one. I killed my dad. You try. So again, we're just plugging in. So let's plug in three for x, right? Because it's the limit as x approaches three. So take three, plug it in for x. Simplify, and you end up getting negative 19 and two thirds. Over here, we have the limit as x approaches negative five. So take negative five, plug it in for x, here and here. Simplify, and you end up getting 30. Over here, the limit as x approaches two of this rational function, take two, plug it in for each of the x's, and you end up getting a limit of zero. Lastly, we take that one, and it's the limit as x approaches one, so we plug in one for each of the x's. Simplify, you end up getting a limit of four. Theorem 1.5, the limit of a composite function, says if f and g are functions such that the limit as x approaches c of g of x equals l, and the limit as x approaches l of f of x equals f of l, then the limit as x approaches c of f of g of x is equal to f of the limit as x approaches c of g of x, which is equal to f of l. 
This, again, looks super complicated, but what it's saying is that if you are taking the limit of a composite function, just plug in that C value for X in the innermost function, and whatever you get when you simplify that, you then take that value and plug it in for X in the F function. So let's do an example to show you what I mean. So again, we have the limit as X approaches negative three of F of G of X. And we have what F of X equals up here and what G of X equals here. First, we're gonna take that negative three. We're gonna plug it in for X in the G of X function. So it's gonna be negative three squared in here. And then once we find that negative three squared, that's just nine. We take nine and plug it in the F function for X. And then nine plus seven gives you 16. And that's how you find the limit of a composite function. Let's do it again. So we have the limit as X approaches five of G of F of X. So what I'm first gonna do, take that five, plug it in for X in the innermost function, F of X. So I'm gonna take five, plug it in here for X. So I get five plus seven, that's gonna be inside the G of X, right? So I take five plus seven, I get 12. I then take that 12, plug it in for X in the G of X function. So 12 squared then is gonna give you 144. And that would be the limit as X approaches five of G of F of X. A long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, you try. The limit as x approaches negative 4 of f of g of x, I take negative 4, plug it in for x in the g of x function. So negative 4 squared minus 1, I get 15 for that. I then take that 15 and plug it in for x in the f of x function. And I end up getting 15 plus 10, which is the square root of 25, which gives you 5. So again, all I'm doing is just substituting here. I'm substituting negative 4 in for x. And then once I do that, I figure out what my g of x is, take that number, and plug it in for x in the f of x function. So I'm going to do it in reverse down here, the limit as x approaches 6 of g of f of x. So I take 6, plug it in for x in the f of x function, and I get the square root of 6 plus 10, which is the square root of 16, which is 4. I then take that 4 and plug it in the g of x function for x. So 4 squared minus 1 gives me 15. Okay, so here's a nice little flow chart for whenever you're evaluating a limit. So if you're evaluating a limit, the first thing you need to do is start with substitution. So start by plugging in that C value to the function that you're taking the limit of. The first thing that might happen is that you get an answer and then you're done. You don't have to do anything else. The second thing that could happen is that you get an indeterminate form. For example, zero over zero. If you get zero over zero, you need to try the following technique. So first would be factoring and canceling. So factor anything that can be factored and see if something cancels. The second thing you could do is rationalize the radical expression. So if it's a rational expression and you have a radical in the numerator or denominator, try to rationalize it. The next thing you could do is get a common denominator if it's a complex fraction that helps a lot of times another thing you could do is use special limits when applicable we'll talk about some special limits in the coming sections you could also multiply by a form of one to try to cancel something out as a last resort you could make a table of values and or graph and that will give you your limit or show you where the limit is at least instead of getting an indeterminate form, you could get a number over zero, okay? And anytime you get a number over zero, we'll go over what happens in section 1.5. So example five says, find the following limits. We're gonna evaluate this limit. Anytime you evaluate a limit, you start with substitution. So the limit as X approaches negative one of this rational function, we take negative one, plug it in for each of the X's, and simplify. And when we do, we end up getting, uh oh, zero over zero. That's an indeterminate form. Because this is an indeterminate form, we must go back to the function that we are taking the limit of and see if we can simplify this at all. So we're gonna use one of those techniques we saw in the previous slide. First thing we can do is try to factor anything in here that can be factored and then cancel. So can we factor anything? Yeah, the numerator. We can factor that into x plus four times x plus one. We then see that the x plus ones cancel out and you're left with x plus four. You could then take the limit as x approaches negative one of x plus four, which you plug in negative one for x and you get negative one plus four, which is three. And that's your limit. Over here, same thing, plug in. That's your first step, always. When you plug in, you end up getting an indeterminate form. Because you get an indeterminate form, you need to try to simplify this somehow. So can we factor anything? Uh, yeah, we can factor the numerator. That factors into x plus two times x minus two. The x minus twos then cancel out and you end up getting x plus two. You then take the limit as x approaches two of that x plus two and you get four. Luke is fat and ugly. You try. So again, always try plugging in first. So we plug in zero, we end up getting an indeterminate form. That means we need to try to factor and cancel. We try that first. So anything we can factor, yeah, the denominator, we can factor out an X. 
And then we can then cancel this x with this x, and we get 2 over x plus 4, which we can then take the limit as x approaches 0 of 2 over x plus 4 now, because that's the simplified version of this function, and we end up getting 2 over 4, which is 1 half. Here, what we need to do, plug in. When we plug it in, we end up getting 0 over 0. It's an indeterminate form. That means you need to try to simplify this rational function somehow. So, anything we can factor. Yeah, we can factor the numerator. When we factor the numerator, we end up getting x plus 3 times x minus 3. But the denominator, all I did was just flip these two. I get negative x plus 3. Now, these are not the same. This is negative x. This is positive x, okay? So, what I'm going to have to do then is factor out a negative 1 from this negative x plus 3. When I do that, I then see that I have negative 1 times x minus 3. And these x minus 3s then can then cancel out and I get it's x plus 3 over negative 1, which you then divide each of these by negative 1, you get x minus 3. So we take the limit as x approaches 3 now of negative x minus 3, because that's the simplified version of this function, plug it in, and we end up getting negative 6. Example 6, again, works the same way with radicals. If I plug it in, I always plug it in first. When I plug it in, I get 0 over 0, indeterminate form. So what I then have to do is simplify this radical expression, right? So in order to simplify this, I'm going to try to rationalize it by multiplying the numerator and denominator by the conjugate of the numerator. So if I multiply by the conjugate here, that's just rad x plus 1 plus 2, I'm going to have to FOIL this. So rad x plus 1 times rad x plus 1 gives you x plus 1. Then this times 2 gives you 2 times rad x plus 1, then uh, negative 2 times this gives you negative 2 times rad x plus 1, and then uh, negative 2 times 2 gives you negative 4. Down here, I just am going to leave it separated. Once I do this, these cancel out, and I end up getting x plus 1 minus 4, which is x minus 3. The x minus 3s cancel out. I'm left with this rational expression, and I'm going to then take the limit as x approaches 3 of this, the simplified version, and I am going to plug in my 3, simplify it, and I get 1 4. So a couple things happened here. I rationalized the numerator. I also multiplied by a form of 1, rad x plus 1 plus 2 over rad x plus 1 plus 2 because this is a form of one, it doesn't actually change the function here. I don't know why I decided to make these during the summer. It's like a million degrees in my garage right now and I'm just dripping inside of this gross robe. You try. So same thing, always try plugging in first. So I plug in zero for x, I simplify, I get an indeterminate form. So now I have to try to simplify this. So to do that, I'm gonna multiply the numerator and denominator by the conjugate. So I'm multiplying by a form of one. Now I am going to FOIL this and I'm getting this over here. You can see these two middle terms cancel out and then the 2 and the negative 2 also cancel out and I just am left with x in the numerator. The x in the numerator cancels out with that x in the denominator and I have my simplified version of this function over here. So what I can do is take the limit as x approaches 0 of that simplified version now and plug in 0 for x, simplify it, and then I end up getting rad 2 over 4 as my final limit. Last example here, again, plug in zero. When I plug in zero, I get zero over zero. That is an indeterminate form. So I need to try to simplify this. Uh, let's combine these by giving them common denominators. So I'm gonna multiply this fraction by four over four. I'm gonna multiply this fraction by x plus four over x plus four. Once I do that, I can then combine these two fractions. Remember to distribute the negative here. And I get four minus x minus four, which these then cancel out. And I get negative x over four x plus 16. And that's all over x. Now, anytime you have a complex fraction like this, I recommend writing it out sideways instead of having it all stacked on of each other. So we have negative x over 4x plus 16 divided by x. Now you know that that's the same thing as multiplying by the reciprocal. And that makes it a little easier to see that the x's then cancel out and you are left with this simplified version of your function. So now we can take the limit as x per 0 of the simplified version of your function. And once I plug in 0 for x, I simplify that and I end up getting negative 116.